a senior clinical psychologist in Beaumont Hospital. His post is currently split between the Department of Neurology and the National Live Kidney Donor Programme. Dr. Horgan has a strong interest in the neuropsychological impact of chronic illness inclusive of diseases such as MS and long COVID-19. He has found a group based and one to he has found group based and one to one interventions using compassion focused therapy to be very helpful in supporting people with difficulties related to their experience of brain fog. So welcome, um, Dr. Horgan, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Eva, and thank you for all your help uh, with the my engagement with this talk. And I am so. Uh, humbled and privileged to be here today and I really appreciate the invitation and I hope that people will learn something new today about their experience of cognitive difficulties uh, and multiple sclerosis and living with multiple sclerosis but also maybe if it's a reminder of things that they all they know already I think that could be helpful as well but um, I know it's Saturday morning and I don't want to overburden people with a lot of slides so I do have quite a bit of I have a number of slides about 50 slides but if we don't get through all of them that's absolutely fine because I'm just delighted to have this opportunity to share what I think is useful um, in terms of deepening your understanding or as I said reaffirming what you understand already uh, about cognition and multiple sclerosis and the impact that multiple sclerosis can have on your cognitive ability. Um, when I do these talks I am acutely aware that I'm in the room virtually uh, or face to face with experts by experience. OK, so uh, the depth of knowledge of MS in this room today is vast. And I um, I selfishly, I always get a lot more out of these talks than often I can bring to the table because I am blown away by how people can express their experiences and recount what it's like to be living with um, multiple sclerosis and the cognitive difficulties that can be associated with. So I just want to put that out there today that, you know, when I do these talks is what I think about, you know, how long has the person ha had to live with multiple sclerosis or lupus or renal difficulties? And it'd be amazing to kind of add up all the years of experience, even just from the date of diagnosis to today. And it's usually decades and sometimes hundreds of years, depending on the size of the talk. So I just want you to be aware of that as well. There's a lot of info in the room today and a lot of experience and a lot of lived experience that is that is so, so um, important and um, is so relevant and so useful. And I just want to honor that today as well. So my first slide, um, it's a, you know, just let's get the admin piece out of the way. It's a disclaimer. OK, so the views presented are the views, my, my views as a presenter today. The slides are intended for educational purposes only and for the personal use of the audience. These slides are not in, are not intended for wider distribution around the intended purpose without presenter approval. And the content of the slide deck is accurate to the best of my knowledge at the time of production. OK, so references will be made, made available upon request. OK, so I just want to put that out there first. Uh, some of the take home messages, hopefully for today, are that cognitive difficulties are not uncommon, as you know, within uh, the population of people living with MS. They occur alongside lots of long term conditions uh, associated with MS. They result from inefficiencies in how the brain processes information. And I just I was very intrigued to hear that you're going to get some, I'm sure, fascinating inputs later on on um white matter tracks in the brain and MS because that's such an interesting area of, of, of focus because I think it'll, it, it always helps deepen people's understanding of what goes on cognitively in the brain, obviously neurologically as well. But um, I'll be referring to that a little bit today, but you're going to get the, the, the real deal later on from the gentleman presenting later on. Uh, the most frequent changes that we observe in MS are changes in attention, concentration, memory and planning, as well as what we call speed of processing. So I mean, you could argue, you could say that's the speed at which you think, but it's just a way of kind of measuring what as, as clinical psychologists, when we think about people's cognition in MS, we're thinking about, okay, how quickly can they get through something that involves cognitive ability? It's, it's, it's a way of, of kind of measuring the speed at which you, which you process information you need to use to navigate a task or to get through your day. As always, a neuropsychological assessment will identify which aspects of your cognition are challenged and which were well maintained for each person. Um, I like to think of a person's experience of cognitive difficulties within MS as 
you know, it's useful, I think, sometimes to think of it as your fingerprint. Um, we all have fingerprints. Um, and essentially, fingerprints are, you know, the same thing. It's skin on your finger. Um, but as we know, the vast different, there is a vast number of different presentations of fingerprints amongst humans. And I think the cognitive symptoms of um, MS are, there's commonalities there, as I just said, in relation to attention, concentration, memory, planning, processing speed, things like that. But your configuration of those different difficulties is absolutely unique to you and your experience of MS. So I think that's important to remember that we are going to have commonalities today, but how in terms of the cognitive difficulties that are present, but at the same time, they're unique to you. No one else does the cognitive difficulties exactly like you do. Okay, so just remember that as well. Um, depression, anxiety, and other psychological difficulties are common parallel difficulties in MS, and psychological help is effective in coping with these symptoms. And I know there's access issues with that. I get that as well, and I can understand that. But I think it is important to know that this can, you know, if there are other psychological difficulties there, as I just said, it, it can be so useful to get some psychological help if you can. Okay. And I know access to it can be challenging at times. Um, I am very aware that I'm doing a talk at the Irish MS Society and just putting up stats about MS, but I just figured I wouldn't be doing my, my job if I didn't have some up there. So as you all know, MS is a progressive demyelinating disease of the CNS. Uh, it's a suspected autoimmune disease. That's where the research is going at the moment. It is leading the leading cause of non-traumatic neurological disability in young adults. And 9,000 people in Ireland are living with MS, Okay. That is a significant amount of people when you think about it. I, had, I was reviewing my notes yesterday and I was thinking about like, what would 9,000 people look like in the middle of Croke Park? You know, it's, it's a, a large number of people. And the onset usually occurs between the ages of 20 and 40 years. It's more common in women. And as you all know, again, um, relapsing remission uh, uh, phenotype is, uh, accounts for 85% of the cases. Secondary progressive uh, is the next one and primary progressive as well are the three main phenotypes within MS. And that's the kind of clinical course that's of the different phenotypes there, as you see on the right hand side in the graph. And I'm sure you're all acutely aware of what that time frame can look like and um, are living with it in different forms every day of your life. So thank you very much for that. So what is cognition? I mean, we're going to talk about cognitive difficulties today. So I just wanted to very quickly um, go through just a basic kind of definition of what cognition is. It actually can be a difficult thing to describe sometimes because it's a broad church, okay? So cognition and cognitive words are essentially words we use to describe the way we remember things, how we concentrate and focus our attention. And attention is a kind of a fascinating thing because it, you know, you can have focused attention. You can have, you know, that we talk about laser like focus on something, or you can have a divided attention where you need to portion out your attention to attend to different tasks that need to be done in sequence or things like that. As I said, doing more than one thing at a time involves cognition and learning new things is a very important part of cognition and reasoning and solving problems. It's all under that umbrella of what we call cognition. I have often used the phrase thinking skills as well to think about what cognition can mean. And that's, you know, that three pounds uh, amazing organ within our skulls. That's, uh, you know, the bread and butter of what it does a lot of the time is those thinking skills and engaging those for you to get through the day and to cover those different areas as I talked about there. Cognition also means how we can plan, carry out and monitor our own activities. Um, one of the amazing things about the human brain is that the kind of, you know, very basically the frontal lobe or that, that frontal part here it's involved in what we call executive functioning or planning, carrying out and monitoring our own activities, type activities. Um, we can also use it to understand, a cognition also includes things like understanding and using language, including finding the right words, which I'll get back to because as we know in MS, that can be cognitively a very common problem within people living with MS. It's also really important, cognition, or to understand that cognition is our ability to recognize objects, to assemble things and judge distances, okay? These skills vary, vary naturally in different people and normal, or as I prefer the term, typical cognition means that we can cope. If you have a typical level of cognition means that you can cope with everyday life. But as I said, it is a broad church. It goes right from the ability to focus on something, to mem remember something, to plan, carry out and to monitor our own activities. 
So, you know, like most things to do with humans, it's complex. But I hopefully today I can map out a way for you to enhance your understanding of what cognition is and the cognitive difficulties uh, that are associated with living with MS. Now, I was asked initially to do a talk about cog fog or brain fog. And absolutely, I mean, it, it is a very useful term because I think it helps to sensitize us to the cognitive difficulties that are present in the population of people that live with MS. But I'm not a big fan of the term, if I'm brutally honest, I have to put my cards on the table about this because I think it can be really helpful to be a little bit more specific about what types of difficulties a person has when they have cognitive difficulties in this context. So hopefully today, I'm not saying it's so something that, you know, it's a no-no to think about cognitive difficulties using the terms like brain fog or cog fog, but hopefully today we have a little bit more of a sophisticated take on what types of cognitive difficulties are specific to MS, okay? When people experience difficulties of cognition, it's sometimes referred to brain cog, as I said, or cognitive fog. These terms are used to describe a range of symptoms that produce difficult thinking, feeling slow, or confusion, or forgetfulness. So, those symptoms are common, but let's have a look later at what is causing those specifically in relation to those areas of cognition that I talked about earlier, okay? It's what's interesting as well, and I think one of the, the, the gifts of working in the areas that I do uh, are I get to see the impact of cognitive difficulties are associated with different types of presentations or whether they're medical or not something natural like pregnancy. Um, but we do know that there's lots of different cognitive difficulties associated with a wide range of difficulties such as depression, pregnancy, um, certain medications and treatments, including chemotherapy. You have that probably again, another phrase that I'm not a huge fan of chemo brain, but that's associated as well with the burden of living with um, a chemotherapy, a chemotherapeutic treatment. Uh, menopause, we do know that can have cognitive difficulties associated with it as well. Chronic fatigue syndrome, sleep problems. I mean, one of the biggest, um, I mean, when I'm talking with people, when I'm giving feedback and maybe a, an assessment that they've done of their cognitive ability, and when we talk about attention ability a lot, right? And it's not just this domain, but I'll just use it for the sake of example. Sleep problems are such a huge um, burden on your attention ability. Because if you think about it, if you're exhausted, it's very, very, very difficult to focus on something, you know? And I mean, sleep problems in, in, in MS are quite common. And, and that again is another factor that can exacerbate underlying cognitive difficulties common to, the, to MS. So if you think about your ability to attend to something as a pie, okay, and conceptualize it like that, a big sector of that pie can be eaten up by not having good sleep, okay? And I know, I mean, we throw out that, that phrase, no, oh, good sleep hygiene, it's very important. It is a tricky thing sometimes to balance and to get right because so many different factors are involved in good sleep. But I just want you to understand, start to start to understand that there are other issues here at play, or other parts of your, your experience of MS that can contribute to um, an impact on your cognitive ability sleep being one of them. Other difficulties are other um, uh, conditions such as lupus, and we're learning a lot more now about the long COVID impact uh, on cognitive ability, uh, which is, it's, it's actually quite similar to MS in some ways because attention, memory, um, executive functioning are, are, are impacted here as well. And of course, multiple sclerosis. That's why we're here to talk today, okay? Um, cognitive specifically then, cognitive symptoms in MS are sometimes called invisible symptoms. And I think that's a very, very interesting and useful kind of uh, phrase to think about because they are invisible. They're happening in your brain uh, for the most part, but the impact of them, I mean, the motor symptoms and the kind of more physical symptoms of multiple sclerosis, inclusive of pain, can be much more visible. But the cognitive difficulties are more co covert potentially but can have, as you all know, a very, very big impact. They can go unnoticed, especially by other people. Like other symptoms in MS, they can vary a lot from person to person and from day to day. Your level of fatigue, the impact of your medication, um, are you going through a, a flare-up in some symptoms for you at that time? That's all going to 
contribute to your experience of these symptoms. As MS can affect any area of the brain, the condition can affect almost any cognitive function. I had a, a client once who described um, their experience of, of the impact of, uh, uh, of MS on their cognitive ability. They said it was almost like cognitive roulette. I didn't know which, only she said, you kind of don't know which area of cognitive ability is going to be specifically affected for you because it can happen because MS can, you know, can affect almost any part of the brain. It can ipso facto affect any type, any almost any area of cognitive function. And I think, again, that speaks to the individualized nature of your experience of cognitive difficulties as you live with MS, okay? Again, how common are the memory and thinking problems? They're quite common, aren't they? So it's 45 to 65% of people with MS report some form of cognitive impairment. In a landmark study by Rasenden and Marsh in 1998, 30% of people were severely impaired, 30% were moderately impaired, and 40% were either not impaired or only mildly affected. And again, that depends on, again, what type of phenotype you have and the, the progression of the disease. But it is very interesting to know overall, I think, that 45 to 65% of people report some form of cognitive impairment. A really interesting multidisciplinary study on cognition in, uh, and I might be biased on this because I worked there, I've done it in Bowman Hospital and is continuing at the moment. And they looked at a, a very nice sized population of 122 people with um, diagnosis of, of MS. And they did a questionnaire on self-reported cognitive difficulties. And if you look left to right there, that's relapsing remission, primary progressive and secondary progressive. Um, the self-reported numbers of cognitive difficulties are, are, are considered abnormal or atypical was 39% for the relapsing remission, 29% for primary progressive and secondary progressive was 30% as well. So as you can see, there's a significant portion of each of those phenotypes that have cognitive difficulties. And that's an Irish study and that's an Irish population, which I think is very interesting. Some studies show that there is more cognitive decline reports in people with progressive MS compared to relapsing or missing, remitting MS. That's that, I think that's an important distinction there to make as well. Um, but obviously there's great areas as to, uh, you know, between that between that distinction as two, as we're learning more and more about cognitive difficulties. But I think it is helpful and useful because there has been a lot of studies on this where cognitive decline reports in people with progressive MS compared to relapsing and missing. There is more of it happening in um, people with progressive MS. Um, the percentage of cognitive difficulties increases over time in 36 to 56 percent after 10 years. The cognitive difficulties um, are 56 to 80 percent in secondary progressive MS. Secondary progressive MS is two times more cognitive difficulties. Okay, cognitive difficulty increases when relapsing or remitting MS converts to secondary uh, progressive MS. And again, like other MS symptoms, for some people, these symptoms will get worse and for others, they won't. For others still, they actually may improve depending on the progression of the disease, but some people with MS may have less lesions than others, but the cognitive difficulties may be more pronounced. So again, the progression of this, is not as straightforward as you think, but we are learning more about it. But I think it's interesting just to have those figures in your head when you're thinking about how the cognitive difficulties pan out for it and the different types of MS. Again, going back to the common symptoms, let's having a think about them, because I think it's good to reiterate these. Learning and memory has impacted attention, concentration, and mental speed, so problem solving, which is such an important skill, and finding the right words. I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people with MS, and it's really interesting to say, I have the word in my head, I can see the word in my head, but I can't get it from here out to here. And that's a really interesting thing because I think that it's it can talk it can, speaks to um, you know a problem that can happen in MS in terms of communication between different parts of the brain. So where the language is kind of almost conceptualized or visualized in the brain, um, and the actual production of that word, the connection between those two parts of the brain, which is often what we call a white matter tract which obviously has myelin around it as well. And in a mess, obviously, there's sc scarring around that myelin. The communication between those two parts of the brain can be compromised. And that's why the words there, you can almost see it, well, getting it out 
can be very difficult because that connection between those two parts can be compromised when in within MS. So, and also people living with MS tend to have fewer problems with language, recognize things, recognizing things and judging distances and position, okay? But just because you have some of the MS cognitive symptoms doesn't mean you'll experience all of them. And that comes back to the individual experience of this again, in terms of how the cognitive difficulties pan out for each person, okay? I think this is just a nice graphic as well of um, the different types of diff uh, cognitive difficulties that people can have. Um, Short-term memory loss is obviously the most significant one. Concentration or attention span, which contributes to memory as well, as I said, you know, if you want to what we what we call encode some information. So that's like prepare the information, break it down into parts so that it can be remembered later or in a shorter period of time. Attention is such an important part of that because you need to focus on that information that you want to remember. And if concentration or attention is impacted, that can have a knock on effect on your memory as well. OK, all these these different um, cognitive domains are interrelated in lots of ways and they contribute to each other's, you know, the, the difficulties in and of themselves because that coordination piece between these different domains of cognition can be compromised in MS as well. But the big ones are memory and concentration, as you can see, and information processing, you know, slow thinking or, you know, just, just getting a bit overwhelmed by information that's presented to you and be able to um, um, process that in a way that is useful for you, okay? Interesting, just going back to the verbal fluency piece here, there can be problems with word finding, as, as we said. Often there isn't a problem with the actual language or production of words with your mouth and your tongue and all the different things that goes on in your, within you to produce the, the sounds that are the words that we want to express, but it's more the ability to connect, to find that word or when the word is found, getting it to the mouth and to get it expressed out in language can be, be, can be problematic. So they're, they're the ones that I'd like you to think about. And I'm sure you're living, you know, I'm again, experts by experience, and I'm, I'm sure you're all, this is very, very common or familiar to you. Sorry, now what I would like to do, I just have a very, very quick um, YouTube video of a person talking about uh, their, her experience of how her uh, life with MS um, impacts her cognition and thinking. I'm just aware of time as well, so I'm just going to crack on here. Um, again, we talked about this, um, you know, it can impact um, some of the cognitive difficult, a, a key part of the cognitive difficulties with uh, in MS are mem impact on memory. Lots of different memory types. I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's long-term memory, short-term memory, working memory, recognition memory, and there's kind of more applied aspects of memory, which include prospective memory, which is kind of memory for, you know, trying to remember what you need to do to plan and organize something in the future, and autobiographical memory, which is your story, you know, memories related to you. How did you get on in childhood? Family holidays, education, work memories, all those different things that that's part of autobiographical memory. But again, just identifying here that short-term memory difficulties are very common within the MS population, okay? Again, remembering to do things, you know, in the future is prospective memory, as I said, finding a memory when you need it relates to recall, example, the names of new people, shopping lists, whether you've taken your medication, uh, memories of events and experience are called episodic memory and example d details of a specific past event, such as a house move or a trip. OK, and autobiographical memories are in that category as well. Knowing straight away what something is, is recognition memory. And that's less of a problem within MS, but the MS population, but it can be. But just to let you know, it is a key part of memory as well. Other Parts of memory are less likely to be affected, such as skills that are second nature, like riding a bike, or we call procedural memory, making a cup of tea. Some, as I said there, procedural memory, you know, riding a bike, a skill that you have, and maybe playing an instrument or something like that, general knowledge, or kind of historical memory. Those things aren't as affected 
in MS. And I think that's really helpful to know that because if we have the, that procedural memory still in place and it's not as impacted as the other types, that can help in terms of our rehabilitation and managing our day-to-day -day experience of living with MS because those skills are there. They're less likely to be um, degraded than the other types of memory skills. And that can be helpful as you try to navigate your day, whether it's to, you know, you know, um, riding a bike or, and again, it depends on the impact of the MS on yourself. I completely understand that too. But at the same time, it is good to know that there are certain memory types here. Are, these skills are still there and are still relatively in good shape compared to the other potential types of memory that can be impacted. Again, attention, processing, speed, and concentration. I think I've spoken about that, but very quickly, maintaining concentration for long periods of time, keeping track of tasks when interrupted. I think that can be something as well. Distractibility can be a bit of a difficulty for people with MS as well. You're in the middle of something and maybe someone might distract you. It can be hard to get back on track, which can be frustrating and upsetting as well as you're trying to navigate the day living with your MS and trying to get on with the everyday tasks that you have to do as part of your life. Multitasking can be impacted on that as well. Carrying on a conversation where the TV or the radio is on, that can be very complex for a person with MS. Doing tasks as quickly as possible. You might be used to flying through things before your diagnosis of MS or as a, or if the degree the, 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 in the earlier stages of, your, of, of MS, but it can take more time to finish tasks. It can take more effort. And again, on top of that, you can be a little bit slower at processing information and might take longer to respond to something. So that's that's quite burdensome. That can be something that it is, as we said, invisible, but can have a huge impact on your experience of MS. Again, problem solving, planning, performing, the executive functioning type tasks. You know, it's harder to make plans. And again, that can and solve everyday problems and that can lead to confusion and stress leading to further problems with attention, memory and thinking. It can be quite a bit of a vicious cycle and that's very distressing as well and can lead to a more difficult experience of of your ms finding the right words i think we've covered that it may be difficult to take part in the discussion because it takes long to express an opinion uh, that video is quite good my apologies again about the sound quality on it but again what i loved about it was that she individualized it to her experience as well and as you could see she had an aid there in front of her she had to write things down to help her um get through what she wanted to say on that video. And I think it's really useful in terms of being able to think about those practical things you can do for yourselves, whether it's reminders about appointments or in this context, getting your thoughts on paper, laying them out in front of you to help you structure those thoughts in a way that's, as we say in, in psychology, there's this, this phrase, I'm sure you probably heard it as well, scaffolding. So just aiding yourself or putting things in place that will help structure your thoughts in a way that makes it successful for you to think through something at the level that you want to. These are just, you know, the different difficulties that can cause cognitive, these are just the areas, again, just a nice graphical expert um, explanation of them. The way MS affects the brain, depending on the lesion site and the extent of them, the impact is just one aspect of how the MS can affect the brain and cognition, the impact of the physical symptoms in themselves. I'm seeing in the chat there, there was a question about pain. I mean, pain in and of itself can have a huge impact on your ability to um, use your cognition to the maximum level possible. And it's burdensome, it, it, it's, it's fatiguing, it's, it can, it's distracting, it can impact, and it's, it's distressing in and of itself. And that can have a knock-on effect on your cognitive ability as well. What we do know as well, low mood, anxiety, those kind of things can impact as well. Changes in temperature, whether it's too hot or too cold, that can impact your cognitive ability. It, the brain is all part of that system. Of your, of your body. And if the temperature, as we know, there's temperature sensitivities in MS, that can impact your cognition as well. And there's other factors, whether it's genetic or the type of phenotype that you have that can contribute to them, okay? I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but as we know, the wires of our brains are insulated with myelin sheets, which facilitates the fast and efficient processing of information. In the early stages of the MS, inflammation damages the myelin and the signals are slowed or blocked. The body repairs the myelin, but scarring remains. Again, multiple scars, multiple sclerosis. 
Cerebral atrophy also occurs in MS, and this happens because when a part of the brain or spinal cord has been previously damaged, cells in that area will die off faster than what is caused by normal aging. So the cerebral cortex of the brain is kind of the more the kind of the top part of the brain. It's actually quite a thin layer on top of all over the brain, and we call it kind of the kind of grey matter part of the brain. You've probably described it, you've heard it described before, but we we know that there there can be some um, atrophy there as well as in MS and as the disease progresses. Um, and then that can impact your brain's ability to communicate with itself as well and to coordinate different parts of it to do different tasks, whether it's language, uh, planning, attention, all these different things. A lot of that is organized. And I often think, you know, when you think about executive functioning, this part of the brain, I like to think of it as the kind of the boardroom of the brain. That's where the executives make the decisions that are passed down or uh, down to other parts of the brain that may be dealing with motor function or language or or visual um, ability. But it's there's a communi constant communication going on between the kind of higher order part and the other bits that are kind of deeper in the brain and more to the back. And that can be impacted. That the communication between those parts, as I said, can be impacted in MS. Um, I'm not really going to go through that because I think we've discussed it. That's just a different, that's a, a nice graphic, I think, of the different types of pa uh, pathology across different phenotypes, whether it's relapsing, remitting, um, secondary progressive or primary progressive. Um, in prime, as you can see there, there's different areas of the, are the different, um, different types of lesions specific to different phenotypes can be observed. Um, as you can see in secondary progressive MS, there can be more demyelinated lesions in the cortex, on the top part of the brain. Um, and in re relapsing remitting, there's more, it's more common to have demyelinated lesions in the white matter parts of the brain or, or, um, and remyelinated lesions in the white matter parts of the brain as well as the brain tries to repair those lesions that were there in the first place. All overall, communication can be impacted there quite significantly, okay? I just love putting this image up because I think it shows very nicely the complexity and the diversity of the interconnections that white matter tracts have in the brain, okay, that facilitate a lot of communication. Again, you're going to get a really nice talk on that later on today. But there's a particular type of brain imaging called diffuser tension imaging, and it can show up white matter tracts or communication lines in the brain. Uh, and on a visual image. And as you can see here, it's actually quite extraordinary, the complexity and the range and the diversity of interconnections within the brain to different parts of the brain as it communicates. And I think it's a really beautiful way of showing that. Uh, it reminds me of those kind of bioluminescent jellyfish at the end of the, the ocean, but I think it can be really nice to show all the interconnected communication that's going on through the white matter tracks in your brain. Um, this can be an impact as well, as we said, on, of physical symptoms in MS. Pain, fatigue can impact your co cognitive skills, as we said. Fatigue and cognitive impairments are most common, the most common reason that people have to leave the workforce in MS. And I'm sure you can all speak to that with much more informed opinion than I can, um, as, they were all, as the majority are living with MS. Physical activities that would be most performed in autopilot may also require more thought than before and thus take from our capacity to think about other things. As I said before, procedural memory um, is preserved better in MS, but also it can be impacted and that can impact on your ability to engage with your physical activities that would be uh, performed on autopilot before. Again, it's that interplay between the physical and the cognitive there. I think it can be expressed very nicely there in that idea that physical activities that would have been performed on autopilot before require more thought than before now. And again, that then leads to another vicious cycle potentially of being fatigued, more fatigued overall, and taking from your capacity to do other things. As we said, low mood and uh, can impact feeling anxious or depressed can affect your cognitive skills. It's quite common in MS to experience this and it can be make it difficult to make decisions. Having in, in people who don't have MS and have something like a major depressive disorder, we do know that their cognitive ability can be impacted in and of itself for having depression, okay? It can be impact their uh, autobiographical memory, their attention, and sometimes their short-term memory as well, and to a lesser extent, executive functioning. But 
again, it's another avenue for treatment and another avenue for helping you to manage your MS experience a little bit more effectively in the sense that if these things can be treated, your cognition can improve as a result, okay? Again, I've talked about that, so temp changing temperature uh, can affect cognitive uh, ability as well. There's other factors too that might be happening in your life that could affect co cognition. And this is this is very practical, and but nonetheless essential to be aware of, in my opinion, if you want to help yourself in relation to potential cognitive difficulties that you have. You know, managing things like infections and other illnesses, medications that affect the nervous system, such as sleeping pills and painkillers, can impact your cognitive ability as well because of the nature. Sometimes they can be sedative um, in nature. A poor diet, dehydration, drinking too much alcohol. And again, you know, simple to say, but obviously difficult to manage for a person who doesn't have MS for a lot of time because of the very, very busy lives we lead as humans at the moment. But lack of sleep and stress as well, if that can be managed effectively or as effectively as possible, that really, really can have an impact a positive impact on managing your cognitive difficulties as well. Lack of physical activity. And again, I know there's variable levels of, of physical activity a person can do depending on the uh, progression of uh, the MS for them. But if you can kind of get that physical activity going, it can be such a useful way of helping you manage your cognitive difficulties. Again, I just want to speak to this in general because I think it's really important. I don't think I'd be doing my, my job as a, a clinical psychologist working with people who live with chronic illnesses, but you know, cognitive difficulties can have significant impact on people's day-to-day -day lives, like work, university or school, social situations and relationships. You know, poor quality of life in those with more severe cognitive impairment compared to physical disability, okay? More likely to be employed, unemployed, less likely to engage in social and vocational activities and more susceptible to psychiatric illness, okay? So again, it's a complex area, but there is a link between cognition and quality of life. And it, it, it's something, you know, it's a very individual thing for each person because their life, everyone's life is different, but it's good, I think, to, to be aware of that link and to improving your quality of life kind of an impact on your cognition and minding your cognition as best you can in the context of living with MS can obviously can have a circular relationship as well with the level of quality of life that you have because it impacts as we know participation in employment relationships independence and social function which is so important for you as a human being living th with MS and um, quality of you know safety falling driving these things again can have, cognition in this context can have a huge impact here as well. And disease and, and managing your disease, you know, cognitive ability is so important here. If you're consulting with your team and you need to make particular medical decisions about how to manage them, your MS experience going forward, it's so important that, you know, you can give informed consent or at an even more, you know, basic level, not basic level, but at another level, you know, being able to understand exactly to go, what is the plan here for me? What does this involve for me? How is the information that is being communicated from my team landing with me? And obviously, you know, teams are very, very skilled in communicating medical decisions and the plans for people going forward. And again, that's all part as well of how you cope with your experience of living with multiple sclerosis. So again, I think we kind of, We've talked about this, I suppose, in, in other in other ways, but it, it, it's an interesting, Laurie et al, 2006, have a lovely kind of flow chart. I'm a fan of the flow chart. Um, but, you know, again, it's just the physical effects of the disease features can, imp lead, um, can lead to a, an emotional impact such as fear, avoidance or isolation. There's a cognitive impact of that emotional experience. Um, these things can happen in parallel as well. It's not just a direction, like the direction that they're going, the clockwise direction that they're, they're presenting here, but that can have a cognitive impact on your memory, your concentration, your attention. That's going to, you know, influence what type of lifestyle changes you might need to make, what type of socializing you do, what kind of educational opportunities you have. And that, all of that together can increase your stress. And that again, feeds right back into that the disease features, depending on your, your phenotype. But it's really interesting, I think, to have a look at that almost circular relationship between all those different factors, I think, that we've talked about this morning. And cognitive, the, the impact cognitively is right on your 
on your experience of MS is right in there as well. And I think it's important to remember how all those things are influencing each other in parallel and in sequence as like that potentially there. It's, I think it's a nice way of thinking about it. So what can you do to help yourself in relation to coping with the cognitive difficulties associated with MS? You've probably heard a lot about this before, but I just think it's important to remember practical, simple, useful things that you can do to help yourself in relation to the cognitive difficulties are using reminders and prompts, keep a diary, use a calendar. Our phones, I often say, are like our external hard drive for our brain at the moment. They can be really, really helpful in terms of helping you remind you of, you know, tasks that you have to do in terms of, you know, helping you with your perspective memory difficulties, potentially, if that's a difficulty for you. Repeating information, rehearsal is such a, such a good thing to help with encoding. So that process of putting information back into your memory, break information down into chunks. You know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time use visual images, associations with things. It's so important to make this as bespoke to your difficulties as possible. Do you need more reminders and prompts than maybe, you know, using visual images? Whatever works for you in terms of the map of cognitive difficulties that you have, like, are my difficulties more related to attention and focus? Then maybe I need to use those kind of, uh, you know, implement these practical uh, strategies and focusing more on that part of the difficulties that I have in relation to my cognitive ability. Have a central information point like a whiteboard in the home. I think that is, look, I'm probably preaching the converted here, but it's such an important thing because again, if you're experiencing that kind of overwhelming kind of information processing difficulty that we talked about earlier, having something that you can focus on that centralizes everything and breaks things down for you by literally having it written up in front of you or written up for you by someone else can be such a, a really useful thing to do. There's some individual self-care things that you can do as well that can help with your cognition. And we talked about it earlier, seeking information, increasing your understanding of MS, hopefully attending uh, my talk today and all the other fascinating talks that are gonna go on today. Will, will, you know, knowledge is power and increasing that is such an important thing. And, you know, the, the, the research is, 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 is developing every, every day and it's really good to keep on top of it, to understand and to really have a good, um, to be on top of what new developments might be within the research and, you know, learning something new about your, something that you live about, live with every day can be helpful sometimes. Stress management, I cannot emphasize this enough. I know it's a difficult thing to do, but things like mindfulness, relaxation techniques, progressive muscle relaxation, they make a huge difference to helping a person deal with stress in their life, as we know, kind of an impact on your experience of MS, but also on your experience of cognitive difficulties within the context of MS. Healthy diet, minimizing alcohol use, exercise and sleep, as we said before, are really, really important. I just get back into the self-management piece here for a second. Self-management involves taking control of the way you think and feel about MS and how you cope in everyday life, okay? It's about playing an active rather than passive role as much as you can, by the way, okay, in the management of your condition and trying to live your life to the fullest, okay? Research shows that people with MS can build or maintain their cognitive reserve. So your cognitive reserve um, is, is a very interesting concept in the sense that it's, you're kind of, your brain's, how your brain is kind of, constructed can be built can be kind of informed by experiences you've had in your life skills that you've learned educational opportunities occupational experiences and skills that you've had over time experience whether it's culturally or familiarly it it kind of puts into the pot this reserve that can help you manage your experience of something a neurological disease like ms because it, it kind of can act as somewhat a buffer against the impact of the MS on your brain. Now, it's not the be all and end all, but it can be something, a useful way of thinking about what's your cognitive reserve. So what things have I learned over my life that have actually strengthened to experience those interconnections in your brain, okay? So that kind of reserve is built into your brain as a product of your life experiences. 
I, and that cognitive reserve can be maintained, right, by being brain active and healthy, by engaging in hobbies as much as physically and cognitively possible. I understand that as well, right? But doing things like reading, writing, or doing activities or such as crosswords or word searches have been shown to help somewhat reduce brain volume decline and cognitive decline. Because again, it's topping up that cognitive reserve and giving you the best chance of dealing with the impact on your brain of something like MS. Okay. Um, I'm just going to put up some resources here. Um, I know I am aware of time. We are nearly at 10 past, but the Department of Psychology are uh, uh, in Beaumont and uh, through the Beaumont website. Um, there's, we have our Mindfulness and Relaxation Centre um, uh, that you can access for free on the Beaumont Hospital website. And it can offer such really useful free resources on mindfulness and relaxation and different exercises that you can do to help with those things that I said earlier that can be really useful in terms of managing the cognitive difficulties related to MS. And we have lots of different exercises, resources, information, and it's it's free and it's available on the Bowman Hospital website. Okay. Again, there's some other things that are offered there. Mindfulness, mindfulness body scan, mindful body scan, sitting mindfulness, lots of different things that you can exercises that you can you know pick and tailor to where you're at in your relation to your experience of MS and what you're able to do and I think that it can be really helpful for you in terms of maintaining that cognitive reserve and just in general helping with that overall um, self-care piece that is so important to managing these types of symptoms okay they're all there um, I think from a psychology a psychological perspective understanding your condition identifying triggers like stress, anxiety, or fatigue, learning strategies to cope effectively with same. I think cognitive assessment, if you have access to it, can be really helpful in terms of you can identify the strengths and weaknesses within your cognitive ability, which you, you know, that can then help you understand, okay, what do I need to focus on? How do I need to support myself as best I can? I think that can be helpful too. Again, medication review, that can be helpful as part of your, I mean, but you're obviously the experts on that are your treating team. Self-care is really important, as we said, diet, sleep hygiene and exercise. That is part of the psychological part of, of their subparts of this psychological component of helping yourself manage your cognitive difficulties. And again, psychotherapy to address adjustment issues such as low self-esteem, avoidance, socialization that can be part of IMS, grief and lack of independence, which are very common and difficult problems, um, uh, which are common to a person's experience of chronic illness or a neurological or chronic neurological illness and psychotherapy can be helpful to give you a space to cope and adjust with these difficult um, experiences and the impact on your low se your self-esteem and your sense of connectedness with other people. Um, as I said, as I said in my bio, I find compassion focused therapy a really, really useful way of working with people who have chronic illness or um, illnesses in particular, such as MS, or I work also with people who have, live long-term with uh, renal uh, disease, whether they're in, you know, they have had a transplant and they're trying to cope with, you know, um, medication ad adherence or the burden of dialysis when they're waiting for a transplant. And I found compassion-focused therapy um, I could spend three days talking about it, but I'm going to do it in three slides. So how I found this helpful is that at its core, it's about developing a self-compassion for yourself, obviously, in the context of the difficult challenges that can be presented to a person living with MS in this case. And it has a central message or philosophy that com true compassion is about noticing and engaging with our suffering and sometimes that of others, and, and it can make a commitment to alleviate and try to prevent future suffering, which I think is a core philosophy to try and help yourself with, to, to cope with living with MS, I think is, isn't, a, isn't a bad one at all. And I think it, it has been helpful for me, as I said, across different types of presentations of people that I've worked with. Essentially, another useful part of CFT and in terms of self-compassion is understanding that we have emotions and motivations that can be hard to manage. And a way of kind of thinking about, you know, how to manage those difficulties is looking at, you know, 
there's kind of three areas in in our in the uh, three there's there's the, the three circles module that can help us understand, you know, how do we map out? How do we understand how we cope with our emotions and motivations? And there's there's a really nice way of thinking about it in terms of uh, from the CEFT perspective, which is that there's three main areas. There's a drive and a achievement part of our brain that says, look, it sets goals for us. It's like it really wants us to motivate us to get going and achieve things in our life. OK, there's the threat and protection, which is, as I say, the really the, the safety part of our brain in the sense that it, 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 it identifies threats and tries to help us. So, for instance, the threat and protection part of our brain would look would be the part that would be involved in things like fight or flight. So if there was a bus coming down the road and the bus drivers hang out the window saying the brakes are gone, get out of the way, your threat system would kick in and, and your brain will move your body out of the way of that threat, which is really, really important. The other part then is the soothing and connection part of our brain that deals with these types of emotions and motivations. And that's the part when the threat and protection circle or the drive and achievement parts of our brain are overactive it tries to cool those down. And that's a really, really important thing, I think, for us to remember today is that that soothing and connecting part of our brain that can help us regulate ourselves and calm down the other two parts is, can be developed. There's a skill around that, and it can be very simple things such as, you know, I'll show you here now. As I said, our soothing connection system calms the threat. So if you think about threat in relation to MS, it might be, oh, there might illness is progressing, or I've had a bad reaction to a medication, or my pain is pretty bad today, or I'm not moving as well, or the cognitive symptoms are really, really on top of me. That's a threat that your brain is trying to deal with, and your soothing and connecting part of your brain, or that green circle, can help calm that threat. And you can develop that, as I said. And it's some very simple things, and if you want these slides, these will be in it. I'm going to fly through them now because I, I am aware of time. But engaging you know, that soothing kind of connecting calming system can be done very simply by just engaging your senses each day whether it's like looking at something beautiful smelling something you like listening to a piece of music okay seeing things that you look you really like tasting things that are are nice to you whether it's a cup of hot chocolate or a nice mint tea but doing that engages and develops that soothing part of your brain for dealing with emotions and painful emotions, obviously, and different um, aspects of your emotional experience. Again, there's some really nice little exercise you can do. The practice is a mindfulness of sound practice, which again, can engage your soothing and connecting system here very, very well. And it's a daily practice and just try to do it for about 30 seconds. Um, I think it'd be really, really helpful in terms of managing your experience of the difficulties of having uh, a diagnosis of MS and a really nice one as well that I love doing with people because it's so simple but very effective and again doesn't take that long to do if you can do it consistently the more the better but engaging the soothing rhythm breathing because we know that the breath is such a really important part of helping you activate that part of your brain that will help you soothe um, and calm the threat system or the drive system when they're overactive. I'm flying through CFT here now in three slides, but I think I, I even if it just brings your awareness to it, I think it would be helpful just to see that that soothing part of your brain can be really, really active and helpful when you're trying to manage your experience of MS. Again, if you take nothing away from today other than me saying to you, please, please, in the midst of your experience of living with MS, be kind to yourself. Show yourself that self-compassion. You know, one another client of mine has a great phrase. She says she L'Oreal's us because she's worth it. Okay. And I think that's L'Oreal yourself because that's really important. Be kind because you are managing a very difficult thing and you're doing your best. And there's lots of things at play here, whether they're physical or cognitive or social or emotional that are a key are are woven into your experience of living with MS. Okay. So I really, really just that's the main thing for me today is that just be kind to yourself, try and get a bit of exercise if you can, try to take up a new hobby or skill and have some fun and be creative if you can too, because it all, all helps, okay? I'm just going to skip to my last slide and do a little bit of salesmanship. Um, there's an ongoing MS research study going on with Trinity 
and Beaumont at the moment. Um, some of you may be in contact with, by us already, um, but it's researching the prevalence and nature of cognitive impairment in MS patients in Ireland. And it, aims, and it aims to improve our understanding of the cognitive changes in MS to better understand the needs of patient, patients. If you'd like to participate in the study, either as a person with MS or as a control, please email my colleague uh, Tara Boyle at that email address and they'll be in the slides, so, which I will provide. Okay. And lastly, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I just felt if I could just bring to your awareness aspects of the cognitive difficulties of living with MS and how you can, you know, understand them a little bit more deeply, or as I said, remind you what you know already, and just some practical psychological and kind of self-care strategies that you can use to help you manage them. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Prof Pender, Lorna Sullivan, our NAP out in Beaumont, Tara Brady, our research assistant, and Cyber Hanrahan, our master's student, working with us at the moment for their assistance with the presentation. And thank you for giving me your time on a Saturday morning. Um, I could talk about brains all day long, uh, but I hope my enthusiasm came across today and I really appreciate your focus and I hope you enjoy the rest of this fascinating day that's out ahead of you. Okay, thank you. Thanks a million for that. Um, it was it was a, such an interesting presentation and, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be learned there as well. Um, certainly around, you know, sometimes people can experience these kind of cognitive issues and not really understand what they are. And there's that element of, you know, maybe getting annoyed with yourself for it and not kind of understanding that that's actually maybe part of the condition that you're living with. So um, I think it's a very wise words there to be kind to yourself um, and to give yourself, I suppose, that recognition um, of, of where that might be coming from. Um, so we do have some questions in. Um, um, some were sent in advance and some have come through. So I might just start with the ones in the Q&A. So um, somebody here, they have had stem cell in, in March to treat their MS. It was uh, very successful for them. Initially, their brain fog lifted and it's now starting to creep back in. Do you have any tips on ways they can manage their cognitive issues? Um, as they've recently started a new job and they're worried their brain fog will affect their ability to carry out their new role. I think uh, I'm so glad that they had um, an improvement in their symptoms and the, the therapy worked. I'm delighted to hear that and congratulations. Um, again, you know, um, MS can be so cyclical as well that things can pop back in and again, and are pop back up into focus in terms of maybe the cognitive ability, the cognitive difficulty that that person's talking about. And again, if she's going back to, is it a she? I, I can't remember if it's a he or she. Um, it's an anonymous attendee. Anonymous. If the person is going back to um, a job and back into employment, that's going to have, that's going to have more cognitive demands as well, you know, and it's going to be something that is going to put a little bit more demand on your ability to attend to things, to plan, to focus. And we talked again like, about the information processing piece that can be difficult, a difficulty for people with MS. If you're coming back to a situation where there's more information processing going on, there is more potential for being overwhelmed. So based off the top of my head and just in, in a kind of a thumbnail sketch piece on this, I would, I don't know what type of relationship they have with their employer, but it might be something about having a conversation with them to say, look, I'm going to need to pace myself a little bit more here as I readjust and to take, because ultimately that's the key thing here is knowing your own limits and working as best you can within those limits, but also understanding that, okay, I don't know this person, but depending on what they find difficult, whether it's planning, attention, information processing, allowing for that during the day. And again, it can go back to those practical things I talked about in terms of, you know, reminders, um, obviously the pacing yourself piece and um, being self-compassionate with yourself as well just giving yourself a break and I think the relationship with the, the, the employer and letting them know and generally employers are, are quite good with this and understanding but also those practical things taking breaks when they need to okay comfort breaks making sure that they've eaten properly making sure that they're maybe getting up and moving around if they're in an office space as much as they can but I think it's about those kind of lifestyle pieces but uh, I put in play that we talked about in the self-care strategies that we talked about but most importantly self-compassionately pacing yourself and giving yourself time to readjust to a situation that is a different kettle of fish in terms of the cognitive demands that you will have put upon you compared to maybe while you were recovering which is a different experience but now this is probably more structured which might be helpful as well but there are, it sounds like more demands and, and work that that is the nature of work. But I think those things that I just talked about, good communication, good pacing and kindness 
and reasonable expectations of yourself are really important. Thank you. And the next question is, what about not drinking enough water? Can that add to cognitive issues? Um, I think dehydration can be a problem. OK, and I think it can be a problem for a person without a diagnosis of MS. If you, I mean, your brain is such, you know, it, it, it needs so many resources to keep going. It takes about 20 percent of all the oxygen you take in in a breath goes straight up to your brain. It starts to die after four minutes if it doesn't get the oxygen. So that's just for the oxygen component. But again, if you're doing practical, healthy, living lifestyle type things such as good sleep, proper nutrition, and again, hydration. Because we do know one of the big things that is impacted again, because attention seems so sensitive, like it's like, you know, if you get a bit stressed, attention that it can be impact, impacted. If you're dehydrated, attention can be impacted as well. And that can have, as we ho I've hopefully mapped out, knock on effects for other cognitive um, uh, domains as well. So I think being hydrated is a really, really important thing. And um, I think that's something that all of us should do really more of. Great. And um, there's lots of praise coming in as well about the presentation. Okay. Um, people found it very interesting. Um, one of the questions here is, how can we distinguish between cognitive difficulties attributed to MS as opposed to associated with normal aging? Um, that's a really, really good question. I think um, as, as our brains get older, they naturally aren't as quick or can't remember things as well as they were when they're in their 20s. It's like any, it's, it's like any part of the body, it, it does wear over time. There's different levels to that as well. And it depends on how healthy you are, uh, genetics, uh, cognitive ability to start from. So it can be quite a complex thing. But what we do know is that um, MS, people with MS, their brains kind of will develop, will, will age a little bit differently because obviously, there's more lesions happening in the brain. It's a neurological problem that's going to have an impact. And there is atrophy happening in the brain and more prevalent in, you know, certain phenotypes of MS. But I think the most important thing is to remember is that, you know, there is natural aging. We do get that little bit slower. Our memory isn't as good as it used to be, not catastrophically so as part of normal aging when you were thinking about something like you know, unfortunately, like an Alzheimer's disease or something where there is significant differences in function, uh, daily function and cognitive ability across a number of domains. But I think for me, it's about just keeping in contact with your team. And, you know, if there is a change in your cognition that you feel is quite abrupt or you feel that, you know, this is a bit different to my MS, you know, the MS can be, you know, you know, I've been aware of it. Maybe my attention isn't great. My information processing, maybe that's your, your, your experience of the cognitive difficulties. But if you find your memory is not, is disimproving significantly, or if you're not, you know, significantly remembering things like people's names and things like that, or things that you were able to do previous to this, I would contact your team and keep them in line and they'll be able to assess that. And if there's a neuropsychologist on the team or, you know, the neurologists are, are really, really adept at, at teasing out, is this part of your MS or is this something different? And I think surveillance and that is really important and keeping your team in, in, in um, um, uh, informed about that is really, really important as well. But I think that I, I, it's probably, I'm probably sitting on the fence on this a little bit, but there is natural you know, our brain ages naturally and it doesn't get as, it's not as good as it used to be in terms of the cognitive ability that we had maybe in our 20s and 30s. As we get 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, we do slow down a little bit. But I think, you know, just being aware of where you're at in relation to your cognitive difficulties and if you're noticing significant changes, you know, or people are noticing that, get in contact with your team. But it is, it is, it is a tricky one to tease out sometimes the wheat and the chaff on that but good communication with your treating team is essential. Fantastic, thank you. I'm just conscious of time, so I might yeah. just um, choose one one um, final question. Um, yeah. And it, it was a, basically about um, identifying, so, so um, it was somebody who had emailed in advance, um, so their partner is concerned about them in terms of their cognition. And um, they were basically wondering how to raise this with the person living with MS without causing kind of alarm or any kind of upset. Yeah, because I think they were the ones who were noticing it as opposed to the person living with the condition. And that can happen uh, because as a person, you know, you get into the groove of living with MS and sometimes, you know, you're 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 going along 
and there's so much to deal with this with physically and cognitively that a person can become very you know can almost have these things happening and their awareness of it isn't as high as it maybe would have been previously because they're just living with it and habituated to it on a day-to-day basis I think you know if you are concerned I think just a gentle conversation and no I'm just wondering I said look you know, and depending on what the difficulties are now as well, okay? But if it's like, I'm just noticing your memory isn't, you know, I just, I mentioned I mentioned that to you yesterday and I'm just wondering, is there anything I can help with that? Because I'm just noticing is, is a little bit more of a challenge for you to remember these things and just gently broaching that subject and gently trying to get a common ground of having an example. Do you remember the day we were doing that when we went to the coffee shop and I said, did you bring the present for the person we're meeting or did you remember to bring that form for something or whatever it is, but just having a couple of practical kind of real life examples of looks I'm just wondering about and I think that's a little bit different I may be giving a little bit of a time frame I'm starting to notice maybe over the last couple of months that this is more of a challenge now it just might be part of the MS or you know should we go back to the team maybe and have a chat about it or our next OPD or maybe try and get in touch with them just to have a chat with like is there something we need to have a, look, a bit of a look into here because I think everyone is sensitive about their cognitive ability whether you have MS or not and I think the most important thing is a gentle, reasoned, compassionate approach where you are coming up with examples of, I'm just wondering, or I'm just noticing that, you know, this happened last week. And that's something a little bit different to maybe, you know, how you would have coped in similar situations a couple of months ago. So mm-hmm. if that's, I think, gentleness, but vigilance is really important. And just encouragement of connecting with the team that is treating them is key as well on that. But it is absolutely, it can be, quite a sensitive um, conversation to ha- be had yeah but just being you know um as I won't say low-key but just to be present to be compassionate and to be mindful of how that's landing with them and how difficult that may be to hear as well mm-hmm. yeah I think um your suggestion as well of using examples of of I noticed this um that that might be possibly a good way to go about it um because if, if you know sometimes if you can't provide the example for it um you know it can be very difficult for somebody then to to understand where you're coming from so um no that's that's fantastic um dr horgan thank you so much for your time and um, we thank very you. much appreciate it um a fantastic presentation well done and and again thank you so much um from all of us at ms ireland and on behalf of our attendees as well um and you'll see from the comments there that it was very well received. Um, so I, I can't see any comments, so maybe. <laughs> but uh, that's the narcissist in me. But um, t- thank you so much. And I really appreciated the opportunity to talk to you this morning. And um, I wish you all the very best. And uh, I wish I could stay for the rest of the, the, the conference today because it looks amazing. And um, I hope you all have a lovely Christmas as well. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Great. Okay.